Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Junior English. We now turn in your hymnals to page 1010, 1011 and following. And the Flannery O'Connor story, The Life You Save May Be Your Own. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting story for us uh, right away. If you'll look at page 1010 under literary analysis, just your textbook company is even trying to set you up to this. Notice the very first thing in bold is grotesque character, twisted disgusting, ugly, nasty, that's the word grotesque. So right away we're going to find a very strange kind of story that we're looking at here. Let's begin, however, with our authors, uh, Flannery O'Connor and uh, our dates, 1925 to 1964. Born in Savannah, Georgia, Flannery O'Connor was raised in the small Georgia town of Middle Village, uh, Middle Village uh, she earned her undergraduate degree from Georgia State College for Women and then attended the celebrated University of Iowa Writers' Workshop. While still in graduate school, she published her first short story, Draining, uh, first heading, Land of the Sick. In 1950, O'Connor became ill with lupus, a serious disease that restricted her independence. She moved back to the family farm outside of Middle Village, uh, where she lived with her mother. I've never been anywhere but sick, she wrote. In a sense, sickness is a place more instructive than a trip to Europe, she also said. Despite her illness, O'Connor committed herself not only to her writing, but also to the habit of art, an unenlivened way of thinking and seeing. In, uh, I'm sorry, an enlivened way of thinking and seeing. In 1952, she published her first novel, Wise Blood. She would ultimately publish a second novel and two short story collections. Next heading, A Triumphant Spirit. Throughout most of her adult life, O'Connor lived with pain and the awareness that she would probably die young. Despite her condition, she often seemed joyous, entertaining friends at home and painting watercolors of the peacocks that she and her mother raised. Still, her disease set her apart, and O'Connor felt a kinship with eccentrics and outsiders. Many of her characters are social misfits or people who are physically or mentally challenged. Although she paints these characters in an unsentimental way, O'Connor brings to their stories an underlying sense of sympathy which reflects both her own physical problems and her Catholic faith. Last heading, religious faith. O'Connor was raised as a devout Catholic in a region of the American South that was largely Protestant. She considered herself a religious writer in a world that had abandoned true values. In an effort to point out the spiritual failings of the modern world, she often highlights characters with dubious moral and intellectual capabilities. The life you save may be your own is a typical O'Connor word. In its grim depiction of a group of outcasts, the story conveys shrewd insights, a powerful moral message, and an urgent sense of the tragic realities of modern life. The quote on page 1011 is a, is a fun one for her. She said, I am a writer because writing is the thing I do best, end quote. Let's jump now to 2B in literary analysis work on 1010. The word grotesque in literature does not mean ugly or disquieting as it sometimes does in popular speech. In literature, the grotesque character is one who has become bizarre or twisted, usually through some kind of obsession. Grotesque traits may be expressed in a character's physical appearance. Alternatively, they may be hidden, visible only in a character's actions and emotions. O'Connor creates grotesques in the story through characterization. Let's write that word down. It's going to be huge. To read this story, you have to spend time thinking about the three major characters. And so you might want to put a note to yourself at level one. There will be three major characters in this story that we are going to want to be uh, paying attention to. The revelation of uh, personality through characterization. Characterization, the revelation of personality. We have two kinds of characterization for 2B. Let's write it down. Direct characterization, the writer simply tells the reader what a character is like. Indirect characterization, traits are revealed through these following elements. One, characters, words, thoughts, actions. Two, descriptions of the character's appearance or background. Three, what other characters say about him or her. Four, how other characters react or respond. As you read, examine O'Connor's use of characterization, noting examples of extreme behavior, distortions and striking oddities that make all three main characters grotesque. So let's go ahead and just put it in our notes right now. All three of the major characters of this story are strange, they're misfit, 
They are definitely different, and that's what makes this story a very unusual story. I've had juniors that say, this is one of the most whacked out stories I've ever read. By the way, your reading strategy is uh, to draw conclusions from details to deepen your understanding of the meaning of the story as a whole. And right away, I mean, your chart here will help you do this. Uh, right away, you're going to want, as you get into the story, you're going to want to begin to ask yourself the question, I wonder how this story will end. The strange title, The Life You Save May Be Your Own, strange title. I wonder how this story is going to end. So right away, as you meet these three characters and begin to kind of watch how these three character, characters interact with each other, you're going to want to ask, I wonder how the story will end, and try and make predictions about how you think the story will end. The other thing, let's say, is that the vocabulary words at the bottom of 1010 will for sure end up on the exam. So you want to spend a little bit of time here with this one. Let's go to some background information on page 1013 before we begin the story, the reading of the story. Gothic literature, I would write that term down. Gothic literature, a genre of fiction that developed in Britain in the late 1700s, features horror and violence. Traditional Gothic tales are often set against dramatic, gloomy backdrops, remote castles, deserted fortresses, and the like. We think of Edgar Allan Poe's Fall of the House of Usher as a classic example of Gothic. Such literature acknowledges evil as a real force and ascribes to some characters a dark side that lures them to violent or wicked acts. Flannery O'Connor borrowed some devices from Gothic fiction, such as foreboding atmosphere and grotesque characters, but she set her stories in an unremarkable American landscape. The story you're about to read is a perfect example of her exploration of the Gothic under the familiar sunlight of the American South. Okay? So I'm not going to say anything else about the story. We're just simply going to read the story. As you read, though, and you're working at level one, and obviously at level one you're talking about summary of the story, make sure that you identify the three characters okay, of the story. I would maybe write them down to start with, and this is all I'll say to set you up this way. Character one, or character A, will be a mom. I'm not going to get into any more detail than that. Character two will be her daughter. Character three, just write it down as the stranger. Okay? So you got three characters who will begin to interact. Watch how Flannery O'Connor will unfold the story in front of you, making you recognize all three of these characters as important. They're what we call round characters. They're all going to have their part. And at the same time, begging the question, I wonder what's going to happen going forward. We now are just going to read the story with professional reader again. Follow along, pay close attention as, you, as we read this, right, to get a sense of how this story is going to end. Here we go. The Life You Save May Be Your Own by Flannery O'Connor. The old woman and her daughter were sitting on their porch when Mr. Shitlet came up their road for the first time. The old woman slid to the edge of her chair and leaned forward shading her eyes from the piercing sunset with her hand. The daughter could not see far in front of her and continued to play with her fingers. Although the old woman lived in this desolate spot with only her daughter, and she had never seen Mr. Shiflet before, she could tell, even from a distance, that he was a tramp and no one to be afraid of. His left coat sleeve was folded up to show there was only half an arm in it, and his gaunt figure listed slightly to the side, as if the breeze were pushing him. He had on a black town suit and a brown felt hat that was turned up in the front and down in the back, and he carried a tin toolbox by a handle. He came on, at an amble, up her road. His face turned toward the sun, which appeared to be balancing itself on the peak of a small mountain. The old woman didn't change her position until he was almost into her yard. Then she rose with one hand fisted on her hip. The daughter, a large girl in a short blue organdy dress, saw him all at once and jumped up and began to stamp and point and make excited, speechless sounds. Mr. Shiftlet stopped just inside the yard and set his box on the ground 
and tipped his hat at her as if she were not in the least afflicted. Then he turned toward the old woman and swung the hat all the way off. He had long black slick hair that hung flat from a part in the middle to beyond the tips of his ears on either side. His face descended in forehead for more than half its length and ended suddenly with his features just balanced over a jutting steel trap jaw. He seemed to be a young man, but he had a look of composed dissatisfaction as if he understood life thoroughly. Good evening, the old woman said. She was about the size of a cedar fence post, and she had a man's gray hat pulled down low over her head. The tramp stood looking at her and didn't answer. He turned his back and faced the sunset. He swung both his hole and his short arm up slowly so that they indicated an expanse of sky, and his figure formed a crooked cross. The old woman watched him with her arms folded across her chest as if she were the owner of the sun, and the daughter watched, her head thrust forward and her fat, helpless hands hanging at the wrists. She had long, pink-gold hair and eyes as blue as a peacock's neck. He held the pose for almost 50 seconds, and then he picked up his box and came onto the porch and dropped down on the bottom step. Lady, he said in a firm, nasal voice, I'd give a fortune to live where I could see me a son do that every evening. Does it every evening, the old woman said and sat back down. The daughter sat down too and watched him with a cautious, sly look as if he were a bird that had come up very close. He leaned to one side, rooting in his pants pocket, and in a second he brought out a package of chewing gum and offered her a piece. She took it and unpeeled it and began to chew without taking her eyes off him. He offered the old woman a piece, but she only raised her upper lip to indicate she had no teeth. Mr. Shiflet's pale, sharp glance had already passed over everything in the yard. The pump near the corner of the house and the big fig tree that three or four chickens were preparing to roost in and had moved to a shed where he saw the square, rusted back of an automobile. You ladies drive, he asked. That car ain't run in 15 year, the old woman said. The day my husband died, it quit running. Nothing is like it used to be, lady, he said. The world is almost rotten. That's right, the old woman said. You from around here? Named Tom T. Shiflet, he murmured, looking at the tires. I'm pleased to meet you the old woman said. Name Lucy Nell Crater and daughter Lucy Nell Crater. What you doing around here, Mr. Shiflet? He judged the car to be about a 1928 or 29 Ford. Lady, he said, and turned and gave her his full attention. Let me tell you something. There's one of these doctors in Atlanta that's taken a knife and cut the human heart. The human heart, he repeated, leaning forward, out of a man's chest and held it in his hand. And he held his hand out, palm up, as if it were slightly weighted with the human heart and studied it like it was a day-old chicken. And lady, 
he said, allowing a long, significant pause in which his head slid forward and his clay-colored eyes brightened. He don't know no more about it than you or me. That's right, the old woman said. Why, if he was to take that knife and cut into every corner of it, he still wouldn't know no more than you or me. What do you want to bet? Nothing, the old woman said wisely. Where you come from, Mr. Shiflet? He didn't answer. He reached into his pocket and brought out a sack of tobacco and a package of cigarette papers and rolled himself a cigarette expertly with one hand and attached it in a hanging position to his upper lip. Then he took a box of wooden matches from his pocket and struck one on his shoe. He held the burning match as if he were studying the mystery of flame while it traveled dangerously toward his skin. The daughter began to make loud noises and to point to his hand and shake her finger at him, but when the flame was just before touching him, he leaned down with his hand, copped over it as if he were going to set fire to his nose, and lit the cigarette. He flipped away the dead match and blew a stream of gray into the evening. A sly look came over his face. Lady, he said, nowadays people will do anything anyways. I can tell you my name is Tom T. Shiflet and I come from Tarwater, Tennessee, but you never have seen me before. How you know I ain't lying? How you know my name ain't Aaron Sparks, lady, and I come from Singleberry, Georgia? Or how you know it's not George Speeds, and I come from Lucy, Alabama? Or how you know I ain't Thompson Bright from Tula Falls, Mississippi? I don't know nothing about you, the old woman muttered, irked. Lady, he said, people don't care how they lie. Maybe the best I can tell you is, I'm a man. But listen, lady, he said and paused and made his tone more ominous still. What is a man? The old woman began to gum a seed. What you carry in that tin box, Mr. Shiflet? she asked. Tools, he said, put back. I'm a carpenter. Well, if you come out here to work, I'll be able to feed you and give you a place to sleep, but I can't pay. I'll tell you that before you begin, she said. There was no answer at once and no particular expression on his face. He leaned back against the two by four that helped support the porch roof. Lady, he said slowly, there's some men that some things mean more to them than money. The old woman rocked without comment, and the daughter watched the trigger that moved up and down in his neck. He told the old woman then that all most people were interested in was money, but he asked what a man was made for. He asked her if a man was made for money or what. He asked her what she thought she was made for, but she didn't answer. She only sat rocking and wondered if a one-armed man could put a new roof on her garden house. He asked a lot of questions that she didn't answer. He told her that he was 28 years old and had lived a varied life. He had been a gospel singer a foreman on the railroad, an assistant in an undertaking parlor, and he come over the radio for three months with Uncle Roy and his Red Creek Wranglers. He said he had fought and bled in the armed service of his country and visited every foreign land, and that everywhere he had seen people that didn't care if they did a thing one way or another. He said he hadn't been raised that way. A fat 
yellow moon appeared in the branches of the fig tree as if it were going to roost there with the chickens. He said that a man had to escape to the country to see the world whole, and that he wished he lived in a desolate place like this, where he could see the sun go down every evening like God made it to do. Are you married or are you single? The old woman asked. There was a long silence. Lady, he asked finally, where would you find you an innocent woman today? I wouldn't have any of this trash I could just pick up. The daughter was leaning very far down, hanging her head almost between her knees, watching him through a triangular door she had made in her overturned hair. And she suddenly fell in a heap on the floor and began to whimper. Mr. Shiflet straightened her out and helped her get back in the chair. Is she your baby girl? He asked. My only, the old woman said. And she's the sweetest girl in the world. I would give her up for nothing on earth. She's smart, too. She can sweep the floor, cook, wash, feed the chickens, and hoe. I wouldn't give her up for a casket of jewels. No, he said kindly. Don't ever let any man take her away from you. Any man come after her? the old woman said. I'll have to stay around the place. Mr. Shiflet's eye in the darkness was focused on a part of the automobile bumper that glittered in the distance. Lady, he said, jerking his short arm up as if he could point with it to her house and yard and pump. There ain't a broken thing on this plantation that I couldn't fix for you.